Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a wonderful event. Uh, we are here with Lavi Tidar for his book, The Escapement. Joining in conversation is the wonderful Silvia Moreno Garcia. Um, so, <laughs> The Escapement. Uh, so, for those who don't know, Lavi is a world fantasy award winning author of Central Station. Uh, the Escapement is a dazzling new novel evoking westerns, surrealism, epic fantasy, mythology, and circus extravaganzas. It has been called comic, tragic, and utterly magnificent. I really am partial to this cover. This cover is so good. Um, and in yes, and in conversation we have uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia, uh, who is the author of such book as, books as uh, Dark Matters, the um, Mexican Gothic, and my personal favorite on my staff pick list, Velvet Was the Night, Mwah, Chef's Kiss. Uh, for everyone who's joining in for the first time in Crowdcast, uh, go ahead and submit your questions under the Ask a Question button below. And if you haven't bought the books already, please do. There's a button below that says Buy Books. For every one of uh, La Vie's books, you will get a signed book plate from him. And without further ado, I'm going to disappear and let the authors talk. I just want to point out, I don't have a copy of the book, which- I don't so know why you. I have one. <laughs> thank you for sharing it. I, obviously, no one actually sends me copies of, of no, books. No, I, I, I pre-ordered it. That's why I got it. <laughs> and they actually told me it was not going to come in, and then they had it. So I don't know what's going on with shipping and uh, books right now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I could have actually shown off my Sylvia Moreno Garcia collection, but, um, you know, which I'm banking on to, to well, for my retirement fund. But um, I think you told me that um, I was looking for a copy of the first, the first novel of um, uh, Signal to Noise, uh, which I had two proof copies of back in the day, and I couldn't find, I couldn't find one. <laughs> and I stupidly thought I could just replace it by looking it up online, and you told me it's worth a few hundred dollars now. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Small print runs, right? <laughs> I should have, you know, I should have, I don't know, should have kept it. It happens. I have all of yours still. I did not throw them out unlike you. <laughs> I, didn't, I actually got guilted by the publicist to give back because I had two copies of the proof. Oh, because they needed it. Yeah, okay. I, they, I got guilted into giving one back and then I don't know what happened to the other one. I'm really annoyed. Um, so if I, if I see her again, I will. I will bitterly complain about it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I actually bought this one twice. I bought it on electronic too because I did. I honestly did not know if it would arrive in, no. when, it, when it came out because, like, for anybody watching this who doesn't know, uh, there's been this big disruption to the publishing ecosystem, and one of the big disruptions has been um, the printing and shipping of books. Um, we are there's not enough paper mills in the United States, things coming from China. Literally, I, somebody I know, their book was trapped in a container, like somewhere in Norway. <laughs> and then, you know, I think it's eventually going to get there. Um, and dates being pushed to like um, people who had books in September, now the book's coming out in January or even later. So it's caused this weird change reaction um, where sometimes when we always expect to have things at the click of a button and sometimes it's not like that anymore. So yeah, gotta put in my pre-orders. It's, it's one reason to pre-order. It just seems, you know, in the grand scheme of things though, I mean, it couldn't have been any worse. I mean, one of the funny things is how well you came out of this absolutely terrible two years we've had because you got, you know, books have been, all my books got pushed by a year and then when they come out, there's paper shortages, there's a global yeah. pandemic raging around, you can't travel anywhere um, to do anything. Um, and, you know, and it's been funny watching how Mexican Gothic just became this huge book over that year. I mean, is it a pandemic book? Do you think there was something about it that was just the timing was right for it? Well, it's certainly like if if I've looked at um, paperback versus electronic and audiobook, I sold much more in electronic and in audio for Mexican Gothic than I have for um, my other books. So if you look at the pie chart, 
you even without knowing what happened last year you would say like oh why is there like difference in the pie um and it's probably because of the pandemic because some people were just buying it electronic instead of going instead of going to the store i always thought that i always think that horror is kind of like an undeserved genre because it was pushed out of bookstores for a really long time in libraries after the horror collapse in the 1990s there was a lot of horror books in the 80s if some people are old enough and listening to this you probably remember that there was this golden age in which you would walk in and there would be stephen king and Kuntz, but there would also be like a lot of smaller writers in bookstores and then they all disappeared and it just became the big k section king and Kuntz was the horror section and then some lovecraft maybe at the top like three little books and that was it and I think right now it's it's been long enough that uh, there's now more horror being pushed out, but it's also an un, an undeserved category, a category where there's some appetite for it that perhaps the industry hadn't banked on for for a while. And and I'm lucky that I came out, but as for other people like Stephen Graham Jones came out and had a really good year with uh, the Only Good Indians and some folks who had been working, we, we had all been working quite a while in this field. It's just that people hadn't really kind of noticed for a while, but but with the success of people like Grady Hen Hendricks and some other folks, Alma Katz, who also did pretty well, it's been kind of coalescing and, and we've all been able to to have some good years. But but for quite a while, for a couple of decades, everybody in the horror industry was kind of trapped in, this little, in these little conventions where you would bring your own little books put out your folding table and sell things directly, very small presses. And, and just now, I think it's, it's, it's starting to catch up. So it's a mixture of luck that some support for it has been building outside of the very niche horror community that there was at conventions and specialized things that I know of and spilling out into the bigger world. And also the fact that um, uh, I think it was it just had a really good cover and the marketing was was on point, the things that we worked on and that we planned were really on point and attractive for for a wider readership. It's really um, there's a lot of people who don't read horror who picked it up, and that's that's why it did well, right? So, yeah. yeah it basically, I think, reached beyond genre to yeah. to the regular reader. I mean, I think in the, in the UK, I know all this sort of small horror writers kind of went sideways into crime and then became very successful writing psychological. What is yeah. essentially psychological horror, but it just got called crime and and sold very well on Kindle. But I was actually in a secondhand bookshop this week, and I saw that they, they sold a bunch of proofs, you know, for forthcoming books in 2022. And one of them was a young a young author um, with making them. Um, Dean Koontz has a new novel out. Yeah. And I thought that was great. You know, Dean Koontz, you can't, you know, whatever you, you know, Dean Koontz just keeps going. It's... Uh, <laughs> He, he wrote this book about writing once um, that always stuck in my mind. He has a line in there that says, you know, sometimes the market is going to be oversaturated in science fiction or in horror. So take the weekend and write a quick nurse romance. <laughs> yes. You know, and I thought that is the best advice, the best writing advice, because everything else is out of your control, you know, pandemics and shipping and paper shortages. But you can always take the weekend and knock out a quick nurse romance. <laughs> Um, so I, I try to live by that that code. Yeah, and and I think we both know longtime working writers who have made a living uh, doing things that sound quite unusual at first, but then are quite logical when you think about it. So I think Silverberg Silverberg wrote a lot of erotic, yeah, erotic fiction in his day in the '70s, and I was telling that to somebody, and they didn't believe me, and um, and then somebody had in their happened to have a copy of one of his erotic books and kind of showed it off and the other person was like oh my god not bobby silverberg but yeah i mean he's not the only he paid, one he bought he bought like a giant apartment in new york on yeah, I mean, good for I him. Mean, yeah <laughs> yeah so, um, so there's always these kind of things and corrections and repositionings within the market where somebody who might have been classified as horror in the 80s then like you said was classified as suspense or maybe domestic thriller nowadays but if it had been the 80s maybe that story um something like um like you like that type of um of of book uh, would you know in the 80s you would have put it as yeah like 
definitely horror kind of thing and maybe stuck it in the because flowers in the attic was in the horror section i remember that when i was you know a wee little child you you know and they didn't seem to fit these books because they are technically kind of modern gothics but they're not like what i would call like you put Kuntz and flowers in the attic next to it and king and they don't really seem to be part of the same family even though they they share some of this grotesquerie um that that is common in the gothic they're just like a different kind of species but they were put there and then nowadays i notice that they're put like in the young adult section or something like that they've been moved to to a different section and of course that writer is now dead and has been ghost written for like the past 25 years or so which is True. spooky in its own right but True. it's just how things are repositioned constantly in writing and if you have a if you have a long career you will probably face some of that some of the pitfalls of the western market just disappeared like there's no westerns like <laughs> congratulations you're not going to be i'm waiting for like, the western revival I western mean... revival, yes well, of course well because the escapement is really i i was trying to describe it and i went on goodreads to try to describe it and it i mean it's a portal fiction but it's also a western and it's also like a circus clown book in a bizarre way and <laughs> so you you put it all together and you end up with the escapement but it really is it it's Sergio Leone it's it's a spaghetti western with weird elements yeah I'm, I mean I'm still hoping I'm still waiting for the bookshops to just recognize that they need a different shelf you know just just for whatever I decide to do and bizarre shit <laughs> bizarre yeah weird stuff you know um yeah, I mean, spaghetti westerns I just find interesting because they are kind of a take on an American genre, but they are not American in any sense of the word. And I think that's kind of, it was interesting to see the book reviewed by American reviewers who just come at it with an American lens when the book is almost, is completely, you know, he's not, he's not interested in, in the American version of it at all. And I thought of how the spaghetti westerns were filmed, you know, by Italian directors in Spain, mostly, um, using a, an international crew. And they were very much sort of political commentaries about European politics of the time. And I think that there was a thing that they filmed it under, they filmed it in Spain under the dictatorship. But because it was a western, it was fine, you know, because it's a western. It's not, it wasn't explicit. So it got everything under the radar. You know, they did the good, the bad, and the ugly, for example, which is such a classic political film. You know, with the with the concentration camp and uh, and the war, but it's got nothing to do with America. Um, he just uses those tools in a way. I think maybe I'm getting off to, you know topic, but um, if you look at Samuel Delaney's The Einstein Intersection, it's about these people who might be aliens. We don't really know who they are, and they're kind of reusing these old myth you know the old west and and that sort of stuff and reinventing them without really knowing what they are where they come from necessarily um and i always thought that was a really interesting book the way he did it yeah it's it's always interesting like the the prominent position of the american critic and the american viewership as the only readership and the only critic that matters and it is true that the United States is a huge market of for sales and for consumption, and it does shape how we view things on the world. But but there's other ways to view the world, and and with a genre, with genre, it's you know it it may have nothing to do sometimes with what people like you say think it does. And there were westerns in Mexico too, like comic book westerns were huge, and in in Mexico and also books at a certain time period. My mother worked as a as an extra for movies, and she was in a couple of westerns. That's a saloon girl. Mm -hmm. Um, but the same thing, like Mexican Westerns are, they're playing with the, uh, with some of the elements of the, of the American Western, but they're, they're going in a completely different direction. And when you try to see it from that American point of view, it, it becomes a little bit strange. The same thing happens with horror movies, like vampire movies and things like that in Mexico. In many ways, they're simply imitating, uh, the Americans, right? They're reproducing the the tone of a certain black and white uh, vampire films and things that would have been done by the big studios in universal horror pictures. But there's this movie called El Ataúd del Vampiro, I think it is, The Coffin of the Vampire. And at what point there's like a couple of musical numbers in a cabaret, you know, because 
musicals were quite popular in Mexico at that time, a certain kind of musical. So they just went like, well, we'll have, you know, some musical numbers. And so there's your traditional kind of vampire kind of doing his thing. And then we cut to a showgirl, you know, kind, kind of situation at the, at the club. And it, it's ridiculous and stupid. And, and it always makes me, because when it happens, when people are trying to consume things outside of the United States, they're always looking for that exotic experience. Like what is the Mexican experience? And they have that image of like, oh, is this book gonna be Mexican enough or not Mexican enough? And I look at media from the time period and it definitely has a lot of times, none of the pointers that foreigners would look for that would classify it as Mexican. Like El Ataúd del Vampiro looks and feels like a cheap European film that somehow is crisscrossed with this Cuban dance numbers. It's not what you would imagine as a Mexican experience as a foreigner, and yet it is. So who gets to determine kind of what a culture is and what an imaginative space is like? I mean, Italian Westerns are obviously like you say, they're not really Westerns, but are they really kind of like what we expect to be traditionally Italian? I went to see House of Gucci and um, I described it as um, people scream for three hours, it the meatball at the top of their <laughs> lungs. I mean, is that Italy? I mean, I don't think so, but it's kind of like this, like what is more real, the imaginary space or the real space? What counts as a... So it's more curious, George. Because I used to watch a lot of Curious George a while back. Um, you you keep promising me a Western novel, though. I keep so. promising a Western, but I have not quite managed to, um, to figure out the Western. And oh, we have a, we actually have a question here about the Escapements cover. Is so much. Ah. Amazing. Did you have any input in its design? Did you have any input in this design? Now I know this story, but. But no, usually I claim usually I claim all the credit for the covers. And I mean, if you look at the the Central Station cover, for example, that did win um, an award, I sort of I designed it as in I I did the very brief cover brief for it. You know, I designed the original poster. Well, the artist actually did all the work, but I said, you know, spacey thing. And they make it into magic. This book, I had no input whatsoever. They, um, Elizabeth Story just came up with this amazing cover, um, and I'm, I've been super happy with it. It's, it's incredibly classy. Um, and no, I had absolutely zero input into it, which really annoys me. Yeah, I think it was a it, it was a hard cover to arrive at, from what I remember from the initial. Um... Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, covers are weird, aren't they? We're not even supposed to talk about covers. No, we're not. Because we're... most of the time we don't have any input into them. And then if we don't like a cover, we're supposed to pretend that, you know, at least not say anything about it. It's and wonderful. kind of think in our heads, oh, you know, in three years' time when I resell the book to another publisher, I'm going to get a new cover. Um, so it, it's it's a lot of luck and a lot of chance. Occasionally, and I know we both do it, is you kind of go to the art department and, and shout at them with the bigger publishers or, or ask them to try and do it again. And sometimes you're just stuck with something you don't like. So I've been I've been really lucky, generally speaking, I've been really lucky with covers, like with The Escapement, which I do, honestly, absolutely love. Um, I just wish I could claim a bit of credit for it. What about the map inside? I think you drew a sketch of that, right? And then... Well, the map is an absolute work of genius. <laughs> I will say that. And I think, you know, <laughs> it was more work to do than the actual book. <laughs> and and they insisted they need a map. All my publishers insist they need maps. And I never understand why. None of my books require maps. Okay. For my kids' book, for Candy, they made me do a map for Candy. <laughs> which is just like, why, do, why do you need a map? And for this one, they said we need a map. So I literally took, and I have it somewhere. I mean, if anyone wants it, it's like a huge sheet of paper. And I drew on this sheet of paper all the points and tried to see how they work. And then took pictures of that and sent it to them. And they said, we can't read it. So I used MS Paint and drew it all by hand again in this giant file and sent it to them. And then said, what is this ridiculous giant file you just sent us? And then they kind of did a draft of the map, and it was pretty bare because there's not actually that much covered in this in the book. So I kept adding to the map. I had to add more and more places, and I think my favorite place on the map 
um, is a place called Curly's Butt, <laughs> like B-U-T-T-E. And I think that's my great contribution to fantasy map making is that there's there's a place called Curly's Butt, which is not in the book. The map is its own thing completely. Oh, uh, my God. I, I had a, such a problem with the it's not in the book with certain dark things. <laughs> So see, they, they ask you to do maps. They ask me to do glossaries, all of my... Right. Because nobody knows what the word means, and I kind of resent that, and I go like, look at that, no. you, you idiots. Uh, but I did, you know, they asked me for a glossary for certain dark things, so I was cheeky, and instead of sending a traditional glossary, I created this thing called Encyclopedia Vampirica, where it was like these entries on vampire types and all this kind of stuff. And I thought it was fun. I thought it was like, it's like an Easter egg or like an extra. If you like the book, you can read that and pretend that these creatures are real. And I got so many complaints from people emailing and saying, there's an Encyclopedia Vampiric here at the end, but there's like seven other vampire types that don't appear in the book. Why is this? This is <laughs> bullshit, you know? And I'm like, hey, it's just like a, it's just like a gift, you know? It's one of those, it's like an extra. Nobody got it. Nobody ever got it. Like, it's just an extra. So, and or other people saying, well, if there's an encyclopedia of Empirica at the end, that means there have to be like five other books. Where are the other five books? Why are you holding out on us? And so, yeah, so I was just like, it's just fun. It's like when you add like these kinds of fantasy maps and there's a place that maybe wasn't described in the, you know, in the text and, but it's there. And I always like that because I think it makes the world seem bigger and, and more real if there's something that's not explained. But, but people really like their, um, things explained in Anglo. Yeah. In everything classic. And I really don't like explaining things. I mean, I think that's what's, that's the only reason, that's what set me back from my commercial, you know, world domination success is that I don't really like explaining stuff. And I've never, I remember when I started out, and you must have had the same thing, is the whole thing about italicizing foreign words yes. or having to use a word that you know they don't know and then put like a dash and explain what it is or and I've never liked, and I used to get, and you know, when you start out, you can't argue too much. They say yeah. house style, you have to italicize. And and at least I'm in a position now where I can just go, no, <laughs> no. I don't want it your way. I want it my way. I don't want to explain it. I just want to casually use this word, and you can look it up if you want. And my, my worst part of any book is the copy editing. Because copy editors are always going to go by house style and mark up my manuscript and do and, and do all those things, and I just spend my time, you know, trying to revert as much of it back to the way I wanted it. Um, I don't really want to explain stuff. Yeah, well, it's funny because the italics thing doesn't hap happen to everyone equally, and what I mean about that is that when I used to read um, books that were translated into Spanish you didn't have an American word in italics, for example, uh, like genes or any other word that is not native to the Spanish language. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be treated with this exotic kind of glee uh, that, that other cultures are treated in, in the English mainstream, but it's not the same way, right? When you're writing from outside a different culture, there's, there's definitely this barrier, this perceived barrier of communication immediately that American audiences don't think exists with their media, but many things in the American experience are completely alien to me. But I mean, now I know about them. I live in Canada, which is more similar in, in many ways to um, to the American experience. But there's so many things that are not have nothing to do with our culture. And yet they're kind of accepted as, oh, yes, of course, everybody's going to understand this. And I'm like, mm. dinner, like, even things as simple as what time dinner is in my culture are not, you know, <laughs> like at all, like what you see in the American shows. So there was always this layer of unreality when watching American media that it was kind of like set in a parallel universe or a, or a, or an alien planet. Uh, but, but they don't think that's the case. And so, you know, so yeah, so it's very weird that you, I had to like, I telecise my words too in the beginning, but certain phrases and, and words in English are not italicized at all, and and you just read them and you kind of accept them, and and everybody can accept that you're going to understand that reality. But when it comes to you and you're saying something about Mexico, for example, there comes a copy to editor. We need more context about this, and it's like, no, you're not getting any more context. This is it. You you, know, you take it. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the thing they've always said as well. That I mean, I've heard this said so many times that if you're going to write 
the best thing you could do is write something set in America or as a as a second best, you know, if you do it in England, it's probably okay. But and it's really you know, I remember making a joke once about writing this urban fantasy novel set in Israel, which was was a brilliant, ridiculous idea, you know. I think um, about this uh, I think she was like a private investigator and she's torn between the gorgeous Jewish vampire and the the gorgeous Palestinian werewolf, which is the two worst, you know, racist stereotypes you can have. Um, and I was going to call it the two-state solution. <laughs> that was my joke. Um, and, and I told it to someone, some British publishing person, and they looked at me very seriously and they said, you know, this would be better if it was set in, in London or New York. <laughs> I had that too. I had that too so many times. <laughs> how? How would that, how would that work? Um, so it's a, it's a real battle, and sometimes I really do dream of writing my version because I have no idea what America is actually like. But if I could write my version of what I think America is like, you know, where everyone eats in diners all the time, they eat pancakes in diners all the time, <laughs> they drive giant Buicks, I imagine. Um, and there's a lot of maybe it's because I watched the X Files in the nineties. I don't know, maybe so. I think there's like UFOs everywhere and stuff. For all I know, this is how it is. I mean, it would be really cool. It would to be visit really that cool. place. Um, um, so uh, we have a question here, and it says, "Were there any particular writers, books, or other work from different media's that you would say influenced this book?" So this book being the escapement. Yeah. So yeah, we I wanted to talk about velvet. Different. I want to talk about Velvet of um, Velvet was the night and how good that is, because um, that's my favorite book of yours. Um, well, it's, it's absolutely noir, brilliant. right? And then you are you're like a noir. It's noir, but it's historical and it's political. It does all the things that I like, and also I just really like the characters. Um, and you know, and I was so worried because <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, don't don't mess it up, don't mess up the ending, and then you landed the ending, and I was like, ah, oh, this is great, <laughs> you know. It's really worried. You know, when you do, because you develop expectations, you yeah. kind of, you, so I was really happy with it. Um, so hopefully my first edition will be worth a lot of money. Um, sorry, but I forgot what the question was. Yeah, influences in the escapement, like uh, some media writers, books or other works that influence the escapement. So what about the clowns? I mean, where, where do the clowns come from? Because I have no what idea what the clowns come from. I thought you were insane. I thought you yeah. lost it finally. Well, well, what I didn't realize was that people in publishing don't like clowns. Like, it never occurred to me. And I, again, maybe that is the American thing, mm -hmm. that clowns, there was the whole clown thing with Stephen King and all the rest of it. It never crossed my mind that people don't like clowns or have a thing about clowns because I just thought clowns, you know, then you go to the circus, there's clowns. Um, and so it completely it was a complete blind spot. And then I was talking to an editor and I was saying, Oh yeah, you know, no, my next book is about clowns. And she just looked at me in horror and she was like, No, I will never publish your book. And I was like, oops. Um, I did not realize this. Um, but the main influence for this whole book is really picture books, I think. You know, I really became I'm a firm believer that it's an overlooked art form picture books. It's not taken seriously, you don't get them reviewed in the guardian or the washington post as though they were great literature or anything but when when picture books are great they are great i mean they're an absolutely amazing art form that combines text and and, and picture and usually you know with like with dr seuss in a very surrealistic way or with uh, we found a hat in a very noir sort of way oh yeah you know so so that was that was really a big i think dr seuss was a big influence on me um oh the places you'll go you can see a lot of that in the dna of it um but also honestly i was just trying to write a simple book for once so that was my main main motivation was to write a simple book so it was just supposed to be a simple linear action adventure thing you know um and it didn't work out that way at all <laughs> So, so this leads to the next question that I'm seeing here that says, when it comes to world building, how do you ba uh, balance the reality of your fictional worlds with the demands of the reader who might find this world bewildering? I mean, I don't really, uh, you know, readers are a nice idea, but <laughs> um, I mean, for me, 
what I realized when I was writing this, and you know, the same thing happened when I was writing A Man Likes Dreaming, for example, is what I wanted to write was the fantasy bits. Mm -hmm. So in A Man Likes Dreaming, it's Adolf Hitler as a private detective. In The Escapement, it's about these cowboys riding in a, you know, a land that has custard, poison custard pies in it and so on. But as I started writing it, there's no emotional connection for me if I'm just writing a fantasy. And so I had to ground the real world into both of those books at some point. And, and with The Escapement, I really did want to write just a secondary world fantasy thing. It's my only, it's a non-political book for a change. You know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't do any of the other things I did. It was a change of direction. That was the way I was looking at it. It was kind of like a beginning of a transition into writing something different to the books I've been doing. Um, but I still had to bring in the real world. And so the book has to have that emotional hook that it's essentially a fantasy by a person in our world, you know, so the stakes are real, um, as fun as the fantasy is. But I mean, whether it's, I don't know if it's supposed to make sense. And actually my editor, because she's a science fiction editor, was very focused on it has to make sense. We have to understand, you know, like you said with your encyclopedia at the end, I have a throwaway mention of these circus, inter-circus wars that happen at some point. She said, well, you have a mention of the inter-circus wars. So when did they happen? What place did they take in history? And I'm like, I don't know. None of it makes any sense. It's not supposed to make sense. But she was so insistent that I ended up writing this scene in chapter one. So it's not much of a spoiler, but it's about a guy who's trying to figure it out, you know, and he's this horrible, horrible professor who's, who's basically, you know, doing experiments on clowns because he can't understand why they're not funny. He can't understand it. And, and that was kind of my way of saying, look, you're not supposed to get it all. It's just supposed to be... You know, just like when you, we look at surrealist art, it doesn't necessarily have to make sense. It needs to evoke something. Um, I always think um, it comes down from like um, American fiction, science fiction and fantasy coming from the pulps and uh, fantastic fiction from other parts of the world coming from a literary tradition that is perhaps very different. So, um, yeah, definitely things don't make sense in a lot of Latin American fantastic fiction, for example. They just are because it's it it doesn't come from that from that same system so it's a case of divergent evolution you know when you have two organisms that resemble each other but really their genetic material doesn't come from the same thing at all you have that in biology um it's quite common and and i think it's what you have with this with you with this kind of literature that you've got some other influences that where you don't have to have <laughs> um, a systematized dungeons and dragons system of viewing the fantastic which a lot of of the American fiction does. Well, I've got a theory. I don't know if it's a true theory, actually, but I mentioned it to, I think, Adam Roberts, who's a professor of literature, you know, he was very offended that he suggested it. But I have a theory that it comes down to Tolkien versus Lewis, you know, to Narnia versus Lord of the Rings. Because Lord of the Rings is, is what took hold of people, isn't it? You know that if Tolkien is going to mention something Okay, let's take the obvious example. Um, you know, the umbrella that, um, you know, the fawn carries at the beginning of Narnia, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a fawn. He's got presents for Christmas and he's got his umbrella with it. Now, if Tolkien was writing that scene, and Tolkien didn't like what Lewis was doing, if Tolkien was writing that scene, he would have explained that 500 years ago, someone in Elf, you know, an elf invented the umbrella and then it ushered in an era of industrial revolution where mass manufacture of umbrellas was conducted under you know dwarfish <laughs> in dwarfish factories and that's how we end up with this umbrella and that's the mode that everyone who writes science fiction and fantasy today is using but with lewis it's magic it's just magic he's a fawn with an umbrella it doesn't have to make sense you know why turkish delight <laughs> you know it in Tolkien's version of Narnia, there would be smuggling, you know, there'd be Turkish delight smugglers bringing them in through, you know, there'd, there'd, be, there'd be a system. Yeah, in the, there'd yeah. be a system in place. Um, but Lewis is like, look, it's magic. Yeah. It's magic. And I really miss that form of fantasy where you just go, it's magic. 
Um, you know, and we got a little bit of that, I think. We get, um, what was it? Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell comes, or Mr. Norrell. I can never remember how you're supposed to say it. Um, but that comes more from the Lewis tradition. So that's my theory. That's like my two cents. I'm not sure I have too many takers on that one. Yeah, I, I, I talked to somebody and they told me they didn't really like Piranesi because it felt like a dream. And I liked it because it felt like a dream, right? Um, yeah. And it does have a logic to it, if you read it. It's got dream it, logic to it. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. I thought that they, maybe they skipped through some pages or read through, read through fast because I thought it was, um, it was not David Lynchian, you know, where you are you watch it and you're like, I don't know what I just saw. And I'm sitting there in the movie theater pausing like it did have like an internal logic. But yeah, they, they didn't like it because of that. It was it was like a dream. So they said that they wanted their fantasy to be more systematized. But that leads me to a question that I'm seeing here, which says, do you think the pandemic has led more mainstream fiction readers to genre fiction? which I've always considered to be more of a pure literary escapist experience. That's the question. I mean, I don't know. Do you? I don't, I don't know what people read or don't read. Um, they read Mexican Gothic. I know that. Because <laughs> the numbers... Um... They, they use it for comps with, like, totally white right. people. <laughs> oh, it's driving me mad. Because we get, people. if people don't know this, we get so much PR email. Yeah because we, we write for the Washington Post. And every other book now is, it's like Mexican Gothic only. It's not Irish. Mexican. It's not Mexican or Gothic, but you know, <laughs> it's just like Mexican Gothic. It's and just it's like driving Mexican me insane. Gothic. Yeah. But every, everybody's white and it's set in New York and there's no yeah. 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 We get that a lot. It, it's like Mexican Gothic only not, you know. It, yeah, but I mean, you you know it's nice to get to a position where your book is a comp title because yes. I mean in a in a way that's a compliment that this publishing industry is paying you. Um, it's just a very sort of poison poison compliment. Um, I forgot what the question was again. Oh yeah, Some mainstream. I mean, more, more genre fiction because of the pandemic. Looking for an escapist experience. I don't think so. And in fact, I think we both agree on this. But I'm I'm not making a secret of the fact that I'm going you know, general fiction next year, um, which is more or less what you're doing as well. I mean, at the moment it's more crime, but um, so I've got a, I've got a general fiction novel, like a proper, a proper novel. No offense to genre people, but I've got a proper novel coming out next year. Um, and it will be interesting. It would be generally interesting to see what happens with that. Cause I honestly have no idea who reads what, or if anyone reads anything. So it will be very interesting to see what the experience is publishing a genre book as opposed to publishing something that is definitely marketed as a literary fiction novel, as a as a general fiction novel. So ask me in about six months, seven months, and I might I might have an answer on that one. I think in general, um, I, I do more. I do know. I probably know more about outside of like the genre fiction readership than other than maybe most genre writers do just because I like to like poke my head into those kinds of spaces. But I, I do think um, the idea that the only genre that people read for escapism is science fiction and fantasy is flawed. I, I know plenty of people who read, for example, um, I don't know, thrillers, which are not, you know, the same thing as a form of escapism. And even people who read literary fiction, you know, what we call, you know, kind of serious literary fiction, as you know as an exercise to get a, out of the mundane and so that I, I don't necessarily think that this idea that this is the only space where escapism is, is can be found is is true and that um a pandemic doesn't necessarily drive people more to to certain spaces just just by default i mean we could say are people reading more romance because of the pandemic bridgerton was a really big hit and we might be able to come up with a plausible hypotheses for that, but I don't know if it would be true because romance has always been such a driving force in the industry in, in terms of sales. So I don't necessarily one thing correlates um, with the other. It's probably longer term trends that are driving um, maybe people to notice certain titles more. The fact, so, you know, we would have to look back more years and not just at the pandemic to determine why, for example, horror is getting a bigger push than it did in previous years and 
and that probably includes a lot of more factors than just the disease so yeah i don't i don't think it's like whoa whoa people are just you know demanding more escapist content um because of the pandemic and and you see that also in media too because like um squid games was a huge hit in on on netflix i think uh and i don't think that sounds very escapist <laughs> to me it sounds pretty dystopian and so yeah it's 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 hard to say how does the one thing push the other but that um that leads to maybe another question Sylvia and Levy, when you begin a project, does category ever enter your mind? Science fiction, horror, crime fiction, et cetera. Or do you just write the best story that you can without any consideration of classification or marketing, et cetera? Do you? I mean, I do in the sense that, that often I'm trying to work both within and push against the boundaries of a genre like gothic fiction. I love gothic fiction, so I, I know the tropes. So I'm trying to play within that space, but also kind of graffiti it at the same time. So it's this kind of um, loving relationship with it, where at the same time, I'm also trying to deconstruct it and reconstruct it again. So it matters in that sense. But if I had been smart, I would have never written any of the books that I have written because they were really not sellable at all, none of them if anybody had looked at trends and markets and and conversations that i had with editors i would have a completely different career if i had been logical you know but at but, least you've avoided the clown trap so I have, you know, at least you've you I'm, know you, you were wiser than me <laughs> um no i never think about well i think about categories in the same way as you that i'm obsessed with formula i'm very conscious of the of what a genre is, what the formula is, and the fun is in playing with it. And I think Raymond Chandler said, you know, all of us who were writing for Black Black Mask at the time, we were working within the formula and trying to push the formula as far as we could without breaking the formula. And, you know, had we broken the formula, maybe we would have been better, but we wouldn't have been read. And so there's, there's a real tension in, in trying to do that. I think with when it comes to you know what's successful right now or what people are drawn to for comfort at least in the uk it's cozy cozy crime fiction you know it's what chandler said that it was crime just to provide a corpse you know, people died to provide a corpse and i found that myself doing these vampire mysteries for tor.com over the pandemic um and it's probably it's the one thing i do that people just just can't get enough of people love this stuff because it's your classical cozy mystery where literally people die just to provide a corpse to to solve a murder and there's something very comforting about it you know because order is always restored at the end you know where you are and i personally i read i read crime to you know to as my comfort read i think i, lo I read a lot of light light-hearted crime um so there is something there is something in that, but I don't know if any novel can really be escapist. I mean, all novels are, have, are political in, in what they do, in what they reflect in one way or another. You can be more explicit or less explicit about it. I think the, more, the most escapist experience that I've seen, at least among women more or less my age, you know, 30s to 40s, is crime, real crime, true crime, you know? And there's a lot of that on social media, Instagram podcasts, uh, web spaces that really tr truly seems to be an escapist experience where people just love to see the gory details like my velvet was a night was featured as part of oxygen networks um book of the month kind of thing and i had not gone to that website in a really long time i remembered oxygen being ofra's kind of women's network and it was like martha stewart kind of thing crafts and crocheting and now it's a true crime network like i went in to see what they were saying about like because they i was promoting i think the book that they velvet was a night as the as the book of the month and so i went into the page and saw that it was there and so it pops up all this other content around it and all the other content around it is was just like gruesome it was like you know like um the fattest serial serial killers versus the thinnest serial killers of all time you know how many thumbs did the thumb cutter take you know the mystery <laughs> of the girl who drowned and whatever it was just really kind of disturbingly gruesome but it does seem to be the kind of thing that women really love and flock lately is that, you know, like that true crime experience, maybe because it makes you feel like you're solving a puzzle, a sleuth or that kind of thing. Maybe because it's an easy way to connect to somebody else. It's a hobby. We both have the same hobby. Let's be kind of friends. 
that kind of dynamic. But that really is the escapist space that I see for women. And it's a very odd one. So yeah, sometimes escapism is not what people think it really but is. It's what, it's what I loved in Velvet Was Denied. Was, yeah. um, that he does, he does it in a very sort of metafictional way, comments on that, that, that the heroine is, is always reading these romance, you know, adventure. Uh, are they comics? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and you get sucked into it. You, you, I can so you know identify with that. It's it keeps buying those and then waiting to see what happens. It kind of feeds in. You know, the fantasy feeds into the real world, which is which is another thing I love to see in books. So it kind of reflects it. Um, yeah. That was that was less a question than a comment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, there's another question and it says, it's for both of us. Let me, Sylvia, your writing spans many genres. Are there any paths or genres that you're still hoping to write in? So something that you haven't tried yet and you want to try. Well, you're supposed to write a Western. I'm supposed to write a Western. And more science fiction. You need to do more science fiction. Oh, yeah. um, Prime Meridian was a really good science fiction book. And then you, you just, every time I ask you what the next book, you know, are you going to do a science fiction book next? And you don't do, like, don't you do need it. to do a science fiction. Um, hmm. Hmm. Well, I think I need to do more clown books. I mean, clearly, clearly the market is there. I mean, clearly. But something different, something you haven't tried. So. People can't get enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> It needs to be clown crime, clown romance, um, clown westerns. Um, no, I mean, for me, I, like I said, I'm, I'm really enjoying, you know, I took that step of I'm going to try and write a novel that is this, everything that I do normally, but I'm going to take the elves and the aliens and all the weird stuff out of it. And actually took out all the humor because, um, you know, they, they they don't give prizes for comedy, do they? They give prize prizes for tragedy. And I took all the humor out, and I took all the fun stuff that I usually do, and I actually discovered that it's quite easy to write a book without aliens or elves in it. You just don't write uh, aliens or elves, <laughs> which is weird, I know. Um, so you know, I want to kind of explore more in that. That's what I'm doing at the moment. But at the same time, I love doing the science fiction stuff. So I've got a Another book from Tacky on next year, which is just a robot novel. <laughs> Everyone's a robot. <laughs> it's all about this robot, and it's, it's it was so much fun. Um, I don't know. I'd like to do a romance, even though I think Central Station is a romance novel, but it just doesn't have it doesn't hit the beats of a romance novel. Like, um, do you want to do like a contemporary rom com, or are you thinking more? Well, like, you know, I'd love to like do. A a, I'd love to do. A, do you know I love romantic comedies? Oh, you do? Okay. I do. I really love romantic comedies. And I love um, like romantic Christmas movies. Oh, so yeah. If I, if I could do like a romantic comedy, Christmas romantic comedy movie story, that would be great. I have been, honestly, I was thinking about it um, yesterday. But I would really like to. Do. I need to work out my meat cute and the uh, complications and everything. Um, I don't know. I don't know. What other genres are there? Have we run out of genres? Um, no, I'm sure there are a lot more. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean the hood. You know, when I was writing the hood, and I was really struggling with the hood. I mean, yeah. um, and I didn't know what this book was, and I couldn't figure out what this book wanted to be. Like the book wanted to be what he wanted to be, and I couldn't really control it. And I tried to find what it was, and I realized that it's a, it's a. It's a genre, but it's a genre from 18th century Germany. It's a, it's a gothic secret society genre. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which has a long name in German. Yeah. And no one has written a novel like this in 200 years. So I was like, okay, but at least, at least I know it is a genre. Um, it's just a completely obsolete and uh, non existent one. I don't know. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs <laughs> would be cool. Is that a genre? No, I don't know. No, no. Um, I don't know. Like, um, there's a lot of old-fashioned writing that I really love, and and um, and and that I'm fascinated with. Like, I really like Henry James's wordiness and really long 
books that most people fall asleep when they read it and um in some micro genres of of ages past um that would totally be non-commercial now and nevertheless it's like you know i would really kind of like to do something in that but would i be able to kind of biblia biblia mysteries because i have got one coming up well yeah. at some point i've got my I've got my L. Ron Hubbard novel that's been the longest <laughs> delayed novel in history. And also, you're not supposed to say L. Ron Hubbard because then <laughs> it's like if you say it three they times. You over, they have you put a bag over your head and drag you out. So it's a, it's a book about a guy who's absolutely not L. Ron Hubbard um, in any way. Um, but that's sort of a biblio mystery, which I've always wanted to do. I don't know. Okay, awkward yeah. silence. Awkward silence. But there's another question to fill out as we think about what else would we like to do, aside from Robert, Roberts and Dinosaurs, which is, um, were there any portions, areas of your literary worlds that you love the most? So is there a part of the escapement that you love the most? I don't know if they mean that geographically or in another, or emotionally or, or what, but... I do like, well, I mean, the, you know, I love the escapement. Do you really like what you do? Like, I love what I do, but then you always move on. So I love whatever it is I'm doing at the moment. I mean, the escapement was interesting because I taught myself how to make computer games in the past year because of the pandemic. So I actually made a computer game or an Android phone game. or You can play it online at itch.io. Um, so I made... Um, a mobile phone version or, a, you know, just a, an old fashioned game of the escapement. And that was a completely different experience, you know, um, of making a game, but a game that is based on this world. I don't know if it had anything to do with it. Um, the stuff that I'm really interested in at the moment is because the novels that I'm writing are historical, uh, you know, historical, you know, they're sort of they're concerned with real historical crimes or real historical incidents. And I'm finding the research is the part that interests me the most. Um, I was, you know, and I, I and I do a lot of random research in archival newspaper, newspaper archives. And um, I even came across the short history of like monkeys in Israeli crime. You know, I just started, seriously, I started looking at monkeys and I found out that it goes back to like 1948 is the first crime involving a monkey in Israel where some guy got arrested for monkey smuggling and sent to prison and then there's like and then there was a monkey kidnapping and then there was you know and there's like there's like a bunch and I thought you know that would make that's like a Roberto Bolaño <laughs> um but that would be great so you know, maybe that should be that should be my next book. Well, I, I could only find so many. I, I didn't find enough to make it. I don't want to make it up, obviously. Monkey fiction. Um, OK, <laughs> here's one more question. Since you two already work together, any chance of a co-novel, of writing a novel together? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> yeah. I, I think most people don't know, don't, what most people don't realize is that our relationship is completely epistolary, except for the odd time when we have an event together online. Right, right. <laughs> it's yeah, very cause... old fashioned 19th century kind of situation. In person, you can, I mean, do, do, do people still see other people in person? Like, yeah, it's, been, it's been like two years. The last time we did this, I was, it was like last year. Yes. Wasn't it? And I was, at least I was somewhat warm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just it keeps so it keeps going and going and going. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever written with anyone? No, never. I, I did a round robin with some people sometimes, like you know, where you begin a story and then the other person kind of continues it for a Lovecraftian mini book that was given away at a festival, and then um, yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it was kind of fun for what it was because it was imitating something that Lovecraft did with his friends. He did a round robin kind of novel at one point. But I just I just found it so weird because I, I have certain ideas of what I want to do and how I want to do it. Mm. So it would be, yeah, I don't know. It would be very bizarre. I I mean, we could do an ace double where you, you do one half we of the could. book and half the other one and then we flip them like that with the cover. Yeah. So. You do kind of you want to be the, the the Hitler of your own Germany, to <laughs> yeah. use uh, 
you know, as a writer. I mean, I, what I do like, what I do like is working with people who do the things that I can't do. So artists or, you know, so, you know, the, I've done the comic, I've done a graphic novel or comic last year with an artist. So it's great because I just get to write, you know, do an airship battle and then he has to go and work out how the hell to draw an airship and have an engaging battle. And I'm making an animated web series with my friend Nir. Um, so again, just to give him something to do, really, that was the main motivation. It's like, let me give you something to do. Let me write your web series, um, which again, kind of takes a lot of the pressure off. It's like, go ahead and you, I'll, I'll just write what should happen and you go and actually sort it out. Um, but actually working with another writer, it is quite difficult, isn't it? It's kind of like, you you either end up in like a World War Two situation or yeah, um, and I, I, and I think we have very different takes, right? I I remember like um we were both talking uh hey the perennial topic of Hitler and you were doing like a something with World War Two and that kind of thing and then I'm doing my own thing for my upcoming. Yeah, I can't believe you you like everyone's moving into the Nazis now that I'm yeah like, I know. I'm out of the Nazi <laughs> business now. But but it was but yeah but it was very different when we we're talking about like we completely were not you know doing the same no. thing aesthetically or politically. The thing is you can't beat them you know I think since Indiana Jones it's like you can't beat them for bad guys there's no, no, and and That's all the research nothing. I've been doing is just insane. But I think we are <laughs> running out of time. Uh, yes, yes, we are just at that hour mark, just yeah. right there. So, before we officially end things, uh, where can everyone find you on the socials? I'm on Instagram and Twitter for the most part, and mm -hmm. my website is reliable and nice. Um, La B just tweets weird things once in a while, like haikus and stuff like that. <laughs> but he's there. <laughs> I also have a, a signed tweet for sale as an NFT for anyone who wants to buy <laughs> Oh, one. NFT. Which I did as a joke. I did it as a joke. And then I realized that I can't get rid of this thing. And I, if someone please take this, take this from me. Like it was really <laughs> funny for like a week. Yes, because you know everyone started talking about NFTs, and every time they mentioned an NFT, I said, "Look at my one." <laughs> and then, and then I got bored with the joke, and I'm stuck with it. It cost me a fortune to do. Um, oh so yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter, and I have an NFT of a signed tweet available to anyone. It will be worth millions <laughs> one day. It will be worth Excellent. millions one day. Well, okay. well. With that, thank you, everyone, for joining us. What a wonderful conversation between you two. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia. Thank you so much, Levy, for doing this. If you haven't already, everyone, please go ahead on our website, buy books, get the escapement, and you'll get a signed book plate. All right. With that, everyone, thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you next year. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>